to the chlorine that they didn't know what to do with. The First World War helped this problem because in 1915, chlorine was introduced as a war gas on the Western Front by the Germans. They were, the British were not long behind so they're just as good solvents as their parents were. Since uh, the, the beginning of the 19th century, the solvents have increasingly come to be carbon tetrachloride and other related materials, all chlorinated hydrocarbons. The real <coughs> boon in using up that chlorine, though, was the automobile. About 1920, tetraethyl lead was introduced to gasoline as an anti-knock agent. This was developed by Thomas Midgley of, of, of General Motors Corporation. Uh, tetraethyl lead does not contain any chlorine, but it's made from ethyl chloride. Ethyl chloride is the material I said was one of the two chlorinated hydrocarbons described before 1800. It's made from alcohol and hydrochloric acid. That material with lead are, are the raw materials for tetraethyl lead. Now, this tetraethyl lead in your engine uh, leaves uh, a, lay a coating of, of lead on the engine, and that has to be removed. It's removed with what's called a scavenger, a material that will dissolve this lead while it's freshly deposited and hot. And the best scavenger turned out to be ethylene chloride, the Dutch liquid, which is the other uh, chlorinated hydrocarbon that I said was known before 1800. <coughs> About 1926, they began to introduce glycol antifreeze. Glycol antifreeze is also made from ethylene chloride. In 1928, Midgley, who worked for the General Motors Corporation and was actually a mechanical engineer, developed the refrigerant known as Freon, which has been universal ever since in modern refrigerating plants. That is a that is a compound in which some of the chlorine, some of the hydrogen in methane has been replaced by chlorine and some by fluorine, which is a, a compound that's related to chlorine. I think it's time to get that slide back. Uh, I hope that I can remove a few confusions. First of all, uh, this uh, here is the reaction uh, done by Basil Valentine before 1600. There's alcohol, with which some of you are probably familiar, <laughs> hydrochloric acid, and you get what I've called here monochlorobenzene, <coughs> uh, monochloroethane. Uh, I'm not sure that's what I called it before, but anyway, I'm not going to want to worry about that. These things all have several names, unfortunately. The number two refers to uh, the reaction between chlorine and uh, ethylene, which you see up at the top there, in which those double bonds have been removed by being filled in with chlorine, CH2Cl, CH2Cl, which of course can also be written C2H4Cl2. Uh, well, here's chloroform, which I've already described. Here's carbon tetrachloride. You see they are they're derived from that simplest hydrocarbon that I had on the top. These two are also used in dry, in dry cleaning very extensively now, and they have a double bond in them, but you can see that various quantities of H have been replaced by Cl. In this case, three out of four. In this case, four out of four. Yeah, can you get it up a little higher? Thank you, that's far enough. Uh, this, uh, now here are the fluorocarbons compounds I just mentioned, which have both fluorine and chlorine in them, including this uh, Freon refrigerant. It's a strange kind of a compound. Midgley must have been an extraordinarily clever man to have figured out some of the things he did. Apparently, the, uh, <coughs> the reason he comes up with it, came up with this is because in a refrigerant, you want something that has just the right boiling point, so you can keep boiling it and condensing it easily at about room temperature. You also want something that's non-toxic, so if it leaks out into the room, it won't kill you. The, these compounds, uh, Midgley guessed, the compounds of this kind would fill a bill. He made some, and they actually worked. 
They should be called, they're, they're called fluorocarbons, that's what he called them, but that implies that it's all fluorine, but there's both chlorine and fluorine, so that's a misnomer. But that's what they call them, so that's what I'll call them. Finally, as long as we can get rid of this chart once and for all, item eight here, I don't know how well you can see this, I guess I'll just have to hope. Is it focusable? A uh, uh, number eight seems to be pretty bad, I can hardly see it myself. <coughs> there we go, that's better, thank you. CH2 and then there's a double bond CHCl. For some reason that's called vinyl chloride. You notice that it really is related to these things, not very different. One point I want to make here is how simple all these things are. I'm sure you know how complicated organic molecules are nowadays that you see in textbooks, but these things are about as simple as they can get. Vinyl chloride you've probably heard of too. Well, that's what it is, and I'll come back to it in a few minutes. Thanks. May I have the light, please? <coughs> Well, so the problem is on the way to solution. Uh, at least the automobile and the, ex the replacement of inflammable by non-inflammable solvents went a long ways to solve the chlorine problem. But then the Second World War ensured the solution to the chlorine problem. About 1940, somebody discovered that Freon, this material which I just described as refrigerant, if you put it in a sealed can, with a, f a liquid, <coughs> you pick up the can with your hand, the freon or the fluorocarbon, evaporates, produces pressure inside the can, and you can squirt the fluid out. The aerosol can had been invented. It was first used to spray medicines in the American troops, uh, used by the American troops in the Pacific War. Uh, since then, uh, the use of it must be all too familiar to you. <coughs> Also in the Second World War, they attempted to make artificial rubber and succeeded in doing so. Among the artificial, among the materials they tried to use were chlorinated hydrocarbons like vinyl chloride, which polymerize. That means that the, under certain physical conditions, the molecules connect in long chains and become solid materials. Uh, names like thiocol, neoprene, uh, were. Uh, the names of artificial rubbers during the Second World War, and the most well-known of them was vinyl chloride. They were not very much like rubber sometimes, but they were used for plastics. Vinyl chloride came out of the war as one of the most widely used plastics, making phonographs, car seat covers, almost all car seat covers are made out of vinyl chloride plastic, uh, electric insulation, and so on. This material, vinyl chloride, had been discovered in 1835, and this application not made until 1940, over a hundred years later. 1942, DDT was introduced as an insecticide. That is a chlorinated hydrocarbon, a little more complicated than these, but it had been known since 1874. It was the miracle pesticide. It's been followed up by a lot of others. <coughs> by 1970, we read, outcries in the chemical literature about the sodium problem. This alkali industry is now operated mainly to produce chlorine, and there are not enough uses for sodium to uh, make it economical, so this is the current worry. The per capita consumption of chlorine in the United States in 1935 was three and a half pounds. That's 1935. 1955, it was 41 pounds. 1975, it was 100 pounds. 55% of the salt made in this country, and we have by far the world's largest production, is used to make chlorine. Pri that's the primary purpose of, of producing the salt, is to produce chlorine. And of that chlorine, the, number, the proportion which is estimated to go into chlorinated hydrocarbons is estimated up to 70%. These are data from recent years. The United States' consumption of vinyl chloride in 1973 was five and a half billion pounds. <coughs> Ethylene chloride, the Dutch liquid, eight billion pounds made in 1973. These are billions. In 19, as early as 1960, 670 million aerosol cans were manufactured in the United States. During the generation between 18, 1930 and 1960, 
the per capita consumption of all of these things together, solvents, plastics, pesticides, only the ones containing chlorine, increased on an average of nearly 20 times, 20-fold. That is to say, in 1960, we were using 20 times as much of these things as we were in 1930. So muskrat, you see, has been vindicated. Chemical research is useful after all. <coughs> what was the matter with those 19th century chemists? Well, one thing that was the matter with them might have been that they thought in using the chlorinated hydrocarbons to develop a theory of organic chemistry, they were actually making them useful, and it wasn't necessary to do more. Another thing that uh, must be said of the 19, early 19th century chemists is that they were very short time, about two generations away from alchemy, and they were not very anxious to get back into the kind of muddled mysticism and empiricism which they were trying to free chemistry from. Chemistry was hardly a science before the 19th century. The followers of Muspratt, the practical chemists, the practical uh, chemical engineers, certainly did not accomplish much in the solution to the chlorine problem during the rest of the 19th century. In fact, they accomplished so little that that may have something to do with why chemical engineering became an academic discipline in the 20th century instead of purely something you go out and learn by working in the works. Uh, the educated engineer of the 20th century is the person who is responsible for these marvelous, marvelously useful things. But of course he got them <coughs> from reading old books written by chemists of nearly a hundred years earlier. The most important thing to say about it, well, <coughs> uh, before I, I come to that, I, I, I would say something that's probably not necessary to say, because you must know it. If you don't know it, you should uh, check up on yourself. DDT has proven to have so many harmful side effects that it's been more or less banned. <coughs> Uh, in 1975, the James River in Virginia and much of, of uh, Chesapeake Bay were poisoned by something called capone, which is another chlorinated hydrocarbon insecticide. Uh, in 1976, a town called Mada, north of N Milan in Italy, was abandoned because it was an explosion of something called TCDD. Something called PCB has been coming down the Hudson River and is the second most polluting material in the sea along the Atlantic coast. These acronyms and trade names all cover chlorinated hydrocarbons. And as a matter of fact, here is this morning's Washington Post, <coughs> which I read on the airplane. You probably can't read that from here, but the top line says, Chloroform in northern Virginia water exceeds safety level. <laughs> That's why I said that I, I didn't know whether I really needed to go into this. This one is an interesting wrinkle, I must say. It seems that the chlorination of the drinking water in northern Virginia is encountering, encountering methane, methane which is generated by sewage, which is also getting in the drinking water of northern Virginia, and the two of them together are making chloroform. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the solvents, the solvents, those solvents that are not exploding, are evaporating into the atmosphere at approximately the same rate as they are being manufactured today. The aerosols or fluorocarbons are charged with threatening the survival of the ozone layer to which they ascend. The solids, like vinyl chloride resins, end up as indigestible junk because they're not biodegradable. Or if they are heated strongly, they disintegrate to form chlorine, hydrochloric acid, and phosgene. A couple of workmen were killed in a Washington building recently when an electrical shortage occurred in a high-voltage line. 
the heat uh, disintegrated the insulation, which is vinyl chloride, and produced chlorine, hydrochloric acid, and phosgene. However, once that's all pointed out, it needs also to be pointed out that DDT stopped the insect plagues. Uh, when I was young, I spent my summer vacations in South Dakota in the 30s, and I remember the grasshoppers coming over the hill in a, sing a solid cloud. I remember, I think it was something called chinch bug that destroyed the Iowa corn crop on a number of occasions. There's the other side of it. DDT stopped them, probably not permanently, but anyone who remembers those, uh, the insects that infected this region in the 30s will go a little slow in criticizing, at least criticizing the people who tried DDT. Furthermore, the chlorinated hydrocarbon solvents did prevent fire. The plastics have replaced metals, <coughs> which would have probably run out before now if they hadn't. The one factor I think, so I don't think there is much point in pursuing who is to be praised and who is to be blamed for this, but there is something I want to conclude with, which I think is worth thinking about. The factor here is one of scale, it seems to me. It's the scale on which everything is done today. And I want to introduce my few remarks about that with a quotation from Galileo, the celebrated father of the scientific revolution, who wrote a famous book in 18, 1638 called Two New Sciences. The two new sciences, one of them was mechanics. He is the, uh, in that book, he uh, gives a mathematical expression for f falling, the behavior of falling bodies like stones. And that is, is probably the first step in the famous scientific revolution of the 17th century. That's what this book is used for. But there's another science in that book, strength of materials, we call it. The, he studied the, what it took to break a beam. Uh, the the uh, Venetian dockyard was famous for its huge cranes, and so Galileo writes about that. And he begins that book with some words like the following, which I'll paraphrase. There are, this is the dialogue between two people called Salviati and Sagredo. Salviati says, experience with the famous arsenal in Venice seems to me to open a large field of, to speculative minds, and particularly in that area which is called mechanics, because they have so many different kinds of machines. And Sagredo says, indeed, I've sometimes been thrown into confusion and have despaired of understanding how th some things can happen that I see there. Salviati. You mean when we were trying to comprehend the reason why they make the sustaining apparatus, supports, blocks, and other things so much larger around those huge galleys than they do around little boats? Segredo. I do mean that, and particularly what we'd noticed that I have always considered to be an idle notion of the common people that one cannot reason from the small to the large, because so many mechanical devices succeed on a small scale that cannot succeed in great size. Now, all reasonings about mechanics have their foundations in geometry, and I don't see why largeness and smallness make any, difficult, any difference in things like circles. They don't change, big circles don't have different properties than small circles, so why should big cranes in dockyards have different properties than small cranes and big weights than small weights and large scale than small scale? Well, there is an answer to that in the science of applied mechanics. Uh, when the crane, uh, it's a complicated answer, but just to give you a rough idea, when the crane gets too big, the weight of the crane itself becomes a factor in the whole operation you're performing. But you will have no difficulty, I think, in thinking of cases where somebody has made a model of something that worked fine that wouldn't work in full size. Many people flew airplanes models before anyone ever succeeded in flying a full-scale airplane, for example. Well, that, I think, is what is going on in our society. The cyclotron laboratory is not just a bigger physics laboratory. There's something about it that's different in kind. 
A hospital using instrumental diagnosis is not just an enlargement of the family physician. A scientific society with 160,000 members is not just an enlarged version of the Royal Society of London. <coughs> a corporation is not just a big company, and a war machine is not just a big army. We might like to go back to the string and sealing wax laboratory, the country doctor, the small business, or the cavalry, but we can't do it because there are too many of us. <coughs> there were about a billion people in the world in 1800 when Malthus was explaining why it couldn't accommodate any more. In 1907, there were about a billion, six hundred million. In 1960, there were three billion, two hundred twenty million people. That's a, an increase in scale, too. Everything has increased in scale, and I think that to solve problems which need to be solved, obviously, it would help if we could manage to think or discover or do research on what the significance is of the increase in scale, rather than go back and try and find the hero who developed something you like or the villain who develops, who introduced something you don't like. They weren't heroes or villains. They couldn't foresee the future any better than we can. They couldn't foresee the scale on which all these things are done. And so I suggest it as an approach to the uh, study of the questions of which this seminar is concerned. And my justification for introducing the chlorinated hydrocarbons is I think they are a very striking example of the problem. Thank you. <coughs> case, the, <coughs> the uh, impressive thing, of course, is changing from uh, a twenty-fold increase in the use of chlorine in a, sh in a short period of time is the uh, thought-provoking part of it. The question of how much chlorine the, uh, the wor world can stand, or, or better, how much how many man-made materials can the world stand? These are man-made materials, all of them, and uh, except chlorine itself. And how much of that can the Earth stand? Well, I, my guess, I don't know. That's the kind of thing the Environmental Protection Agency is very likely to give somebody a grant for. Uh, it's, uh, but that you can even raise such, raise such questions is, uh, a suggestion that, that one ought to start thinking about. Of course, there are all sorts of aspects of this that, that lead to that conclusion. Uh, I, I don't know whether I've answered your question or not, have I? Probably as well as one can. <laughs> yeah, uh, as, uh, in, as far as the 100 consumption of 100 pounds of chlorine per person is concerned, the only significant thing about it, I think, is that it's about 20 times as much as people were consuming a generation earlier. Yeah, there are all kinds of, th this is sort of interesting from the point of view of time lags. I don't think it fits any theory I ever heard about time lag. I've heard papers where people say, uh, in the 19th century the time lag was such and such, and in the 20th century it's reduced to some other very small number. Well, maybe so. This case suggests that, that the, uh, 
the time lag I don't think represents much of anything. It was, it was the, the chlorine problem needed to be solved. And when the chlorine problem needed to be solved, they went back in those old books and found these century-old uh, substances. They also found that the chemists had described their properties. Those, the chemists who made them in the first place said the more chlorine you put in, the less inflammable it gets. What was needed was for somebody to say, we ought to have in on in non-inflammable solvents. But they went on using inflammable solvents through the 19th century, and one wonders if they ever would have introduced non-inflammable solvents if it hadn't been for the chlorine salesman, who had all his chlorine to get rid of. <coughs> I mean, I've got much, not got much better explanation than that to offer. I have no theory about time lag. I don't see any there. The chlorine problem of the 20th century is surely what brought all these immense uses into being. They gave an incentive. In other words, we should submit fifth uh, proliferation of sodium products as well. Uh, I, I <laughs> we now have sodium <laughs> products are generally biodegradable, as far as I know. <laughs> but uh, I don't know that I can <laughs> say any more than that about what we should do. <laughs> Wingler School of Chemistry perceived problems with inventing these sort of non-natural substances like, like we're talking about now? I'm sorry, would you say that again? The, I guess I come from the Swindler School, the people who objected to making the hydrocarbons. Oh, uh, the objection to the hydrocarbons was not to making them. It was to the affront that this whole this whole method of uh, theory of organic chemistry gave to the traditional theory. This was a typical inter-academic fight. The traditional theory was that all compounds, organic or otherwise, consist of a positive part and a negative part. And this chlorine, the work was being done with chlorinated hydrocarbons, seemed to contradict it because chlorine, which was negative, was replacing hydrogen, which was positive. This was a kind of an internal matter. No. No, that, uh, there's nothing about that in there. It was simply an insult to the fathers of the science who had posed the old theory that was being replaced. Nothing more to it than that. They were made in small quantities. <laughs> uh, until these things began to be produced in enormous quantities, the questions didn't exist. <laughs> I mean, nobody would get up and denounce DTT if only small amounts of it were being used. There'd be no reason to. Yeah. The same is true of strontium-90. Of what? Strontium-90. Oh, sh yeah, sure. Scale. We live in a world dominated by scale, but we reason about this world in terms of a world that's gone. Not very long gone, only about maybe 30, 40 years ago. Uh, but now, hardly anything happens in, unless it happens on an enormous scale. From the hula hoop to rock music to chlorinated hydrocarbons, it's worldwide on a mass scale. And it becomes a different phenomenon. That's my argument. Sometimes the definition between what is natural and unnatural isn't always obvious. We forget, for example, in the case of chlorine, that there is a world where there's lots of chlorine right here on Earth, and that's on, under the ocean. Under the ocean? In the ocean. Well, it exists there as sodium chloride. No, not all. There are many that's being found now that these plants and animals in the ocean indeed have chlorinated hydrocarbons in them. Is that so? I didn't know it. Right. Are they edible? Most of them would be very toxic to us, but they must do something for them. In their, in their own society. <laughs> yeah. uh, when we talk about technology and value systems, I think that the problem of, of mass problems and overreaction to them is something we have to live with today that uh, the German chemists of the last century that enjoy just insulting each other in journals uh, didn't have. And uh, I think there are many examples of this 
in modern science, modern scholarship that we face. I think recombinant D DNA is one case where uh, society as a whole is running scared, and so they're going to put, uh, I think, uh, much too strict regulations on what a person can do. Or the use of, uh, of drugs of various kinds, uh, even in fairly innocuous ways now, are under such a bureaucratic shield uh, that it takes years to be able to inject a rat with uh, some anesthetic because you have to have all of the the uh, permissions from the federal government down to uh, the city of Ames to be able to do that. So I think this this fact of backlash which has existed in all societies is with us in a very pernicious form today. That is, because there is a problem over which the scientist or the scholar has no control, there tends to be over-regulation of the scientist and over-regulation of his creative effort. And I think as, as we're talking about technology in society, this is a problem which uh, I don't think many people are facing now. That is a stifling creative effort because everybody's running scared. Well, I don't think there's any doubt that is the case. Uh, and what I'm suggesting I, uh, is, is a, 